أولنا محمد أوسطنا محمد آخرنا محمد صل على محمد آخرنا محمد صل على جب تزهر الأرض وانت سعيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نظيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله التيبين الطاهرين المأسمين المظلومين الله سبحانه وتعالى in his blessed Quran tells us the following in the 14th chapter verse 24 ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون صدق الله العلي الرحيم سلواتنا محمد وآله الله أكبر صلى الله All praise belongs to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and Allah سبحانه وتعالى has blessed us with this existence as I say always and giving us the opportunity to participate in elevating our own status. As I mentioned two nights ago, that one of the most uh, prominent mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala besides all the rest that we cannot even account for is this power of limited free will that we have, this ability to choose our own destiny. This is very, very fundamental in all our discussions because if we understand it, we will realize our obligations. Unfortunately, there are people who think that God's destiny has been preordained and set, and there is nothing that we can do to change it. Unfortunately, unfortunately, sometimes we're told that the destiny of Allah is set in such a way that no matter what we do, since Allah already knows our future, there is nothing that we can do to change it. This is not true from the point of view of destiny. Sure, Allah knows everything that happens even before it happens, even before it comes to existence. For Allah is not bound in time. Time is a creation of Allah. But having said that, if you and I take the principles of predestination in its fullest form, as some have stipulated, it negates the very function and purpose of life when it comes to our obligations to submit to Allah willfully. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many verses lays this foundation very clearly and there should be no confusion in this matter. <coughs> For example, in Surah Al-A'la, Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Sabbi hisma rabbika al-A'la, alladhi khalaqa fasawwa, walladhi qaddara fahada. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us very clearly that He creates us with a destiny and guides it to its destiny. In another verse, Allah says, uh, هَلْ أَتَعَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا إِنَّا خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ نُطْفَةٍ أَمْشَاجٍ نَبْتَلِيهِ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ سَمِيعًا بَصِيرًا إِنَّا حَدَيْنَاهُ السَّبِيلًا إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا So Allah SWT is establishing that has mankind not considered that they were not worthy of being mentioned هَلْ أَتَعْلَى الْإِنسَانُ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا That when you and I, before we were born, we were insignificant to anybody, including our parents. In fact, it would be absurd for our parents to talk about us because we are not in existence yet. So we all agree that there was a time we were not existent. And Allah is asking us, have you not considered that there was no significance to you? You had no significance. You see? <laughs> not even a little. Allah says, We created you in the Khalaqna uh, We made you from that which clings, meaning that which clots, meaning this the the material of the male and the female that brings about the birth of a child. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and we guided you. You see? We gave you hearing, sight. We gave you and guided you. Hadaynahu sabila. Whether you are grateful or ungrateful. Imma shakiran wa imma kafura. Here, Quran is establishing a very clear uh, precedence that mankind has the ability to accept the mercy of God and has the ability to reject the mercy of God. Here, the evidence is very clear for many verses in the Quran that humans have limited free will. Limited. Not totality of free will. Please understand that. There is no such thing in the created universe that has totality of free will. No one possesses totality of free will except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِذَا قَضَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَقُولُ لَهُ كُنْ When God decrees a matter, He has totality of free will, none of us have it. We have limited free will. And this limited free will is what is under examination. Anything outside of the limited free will is not being examined. Our gender, our birth date, our structure, our physical structure, our family background, all of these are not under trial. We are not tested. Our skin color, our height, our size, these are not under trial. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us these capacities without asking us, and therefore those are not under trial. What is under our free will is our ability to proactively promote a positive thing or our ability to proactively prevent a positive thing. Those two qualities are really what is under trial. So Allah has blessed us with this ability. And having placed this ability in perspective, what will enable us to pass this trial, it is to fulfill the obligation of acquisition of knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already endowed us with this aql, which is what we call intelligence, the capacity to absorb knowledge, the capacity to process knowledge, and the capacity to reach higher levels of knowledge, wherein we can become what we call wise sages in society. Meaning we have now the ability to connect the dots and to see the bigger picture and to see behind the curtain without moving the curtain. That's hikmah, wisdom. All these capacities are there but they require proactivity. For example, a sincere desire to want something. That sincere desire is under trial. When you proactively step forward to want to do something. Give the good news to the believers who do good deeds. Proactivity. When you're proactively moving to promote good or to stop a destruction or a damage, then that individual now is engaging in that limited free will to do something proactively. That proactive stance requires a desire, a will. This will has also been placed in us. We have it. We have three kinds of, uh, four kinds of powers as we know, the general powers. There are many, but the four main ones, قوة الشحوية, عقلية, right? وحمية, غضبية. These powers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, the power of anger, the power of intellect, aqaliyya, right? Uh, power of imagination, the power of anger. These are energies, systems that Allah has placed in us that enable us to move. Without these, we would have no desire to do anything. We would simply be in a receive mode, not in a give mode. And as a result, Allah has prescribed upon us an obligation. And that obligation is the acquisition of knowledge. The Messenger of Allah, Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has said the most sick individual in society is a jahil individual, an ignorant person. An ignorant person is the, is the person who is the most sick in society, the one who causes the most danger. That while they love you, they will hug you and they will crush your lungs. Because they love you so much. That the end result is destruction. Though the initial initiative was love, it ended up in destruction. That's the cause of ignorance. And society today, level of knowledge is very low and shallow. Hence, 
if you look at our economic systems today and look at how media presents television shows and movies, you'll find there's very little moral lessons, very few moral lessons in these movies. It's more impulsive behavior, instantaneous gratification, everything for now, whatever glitters, just run after it, and just blurt out any four-letter explicative as long as it makes you happy and laugh. Who cares? It doesn't matter. As long as we're all just living by the day and having a good time. Nothing for the future. <coughs> Live by the day. This impulsive behavior ultimately becomes compulsive because then we become so attached to this cyclical order that media now simply feeds into this frenzy that without sex and violence, nothing sells from Hollywood. You have to have two components. That even if it's a nice family show, there has to be some kind of a sexual innuendo that has to be sent out because otherwise people say this is boring. You find that the, the um, systems that are, I mean, the media and entertainment industries that make the most money are these boxing institutions and wrestling institutions. Why is it this kickboxing and you have all these uh, events taking place where there's this very, very wild behavior of fighting where blood comes out and people just love it. And it makes them millions and billions of dollars. And then on the other side, you've got advertising agencies that simply cannot sell anything, including a car, anything, without having some scanty dressed female. Usually it's the female that's the selling objective, because usually you put a, a nice looking woman next to any product, the fantasy starts to go, and then he starts to associate with the product, and then the next thing you know, it's selling. So our knowledge level is so weak that we're being attracted almost like animals, like as if, you know, the, um, the matador is, you know, just simply waving a red flag and the bull charges towards it. Really, there's no difference between that scenario and how we are in the world today. So our obligation is to acquire knowledge. The Messenger of Allah has said, اطلب العلم من المهد للهد. Acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Cradle. Meaning there is not a moment in your life when you should not be acquiring knowledge. <coughs> Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, has told us, Salawat oh, 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 He has said there are three kinds of people in society. There is the learned, meaning the sage, the one with hikmah and aql, uh, the one who is an alim, true alim, who teaches, then there is the student who learns. The society is composed of three groups of people. The one who is learned teaching, the one who is learning, who is a student, and then the third group, Imam calls them basically rubbish, trash. Now why is that third group trash? Because the objective of this earth, our existence on this earth, is to continually acquire knowledge. That if we do not proactively, continually, reflect, cogitate, contemplate to, at a constant level to try to understand the meaning of life, then we are rubbish, <coughs> as Imam Ali says. Because if a human being is not using this finite moment of time to acquire a critical piece of information in life, then that such a person is a foolish individual. Sadly, when we examine all the things that really attract our generations today, especially today, they are instruments designed to stun the proactive acquisition of knowledge. For example, take these games, the Xboxes and the PS3s, right? The children are so engrossed in that. If you look at the objective of the game, there is minimal acquisition of knowledge. There is really nothing to account for if you spend, you know, there are people who I know who are professionals, graduates from West Point, who went through <coughs> divorces and literally left their wives because they were addicted to Halo. Halo 1, Halo 2, and it's so addictive, sometimes they get stuck in a house for a, a whole three, four days, they don't come out. And they're just playing these dumb games with the rest of the world, because especially now, with the internet, you find that it's no longer playing with somebody in your room, you're playing with somebody on the other side of Earth. And they're so addicted, and it's a 24-hour cycle. Remember, the IT boom, created the world where this 24 hours shrunk to eight hours. I remember when I had my office in India and in, in the Middle East, and I'm in New York, 
I have my three offices running simultaneously, I could hardly sleep. Because by the time I'm going to sleep, India's waking up. You know? And by the time, you know, I'm waking up, the other group is, I mean, it's just like impossible. The 24 hour cycle makes it you're on a constant cycle. Now imagine an individual online talking to the world. You know, our society, let's say we're in Denver at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, everyone's going to sleep. Yeah, but the other side of the earth is very active. So this individual now is completely engrossed, but the accountability is practically nothing. And that's exactly what Iblis says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Iblis says this to Allah, by your authority, I will beguile them all. This beguiling comes through such systems. We have to be aware of them. Turn the television on, and you find these shows that are mind-numbing. They're stupid, many of them. But yet they make ratings. And they go on 24 hours a day. And you've got so many channels that you can flick for hours, and you can still not encapsulate what's really happening out there. Just the overload of information. Plus now with the internet, plus the YouTube revolution, plus everything accessible live in 3D motion. Imagine the engrossed, the engrossed uh, individual now. We say, wow, we're living in the world of information age. True. But what are we processing? How much of this information is being processed? How carefully is it being monitored? How is it being filtered? That when I'm reading something online, how do I know what I'm reading is sensible? Okay. And I have no trust even with great institutions. Look at BBC. British Broadcasting Corporation had one of the highest ratings in terms of uh, integrity. When they protected Jimmy Savile, who was a pedophile, for 50 years they protected this man. And so many pedophiles were protected by the BBC. You look at the CNNs and all these great big, big media conglomerates. They're all after money. The children. We're not talking Muslim children, we're talking British children who are being molested for 50 years only because this guy's a superstar, no one dares to touch him? That morality goes out the window in order to maintain one's position in money? This is the danger. So when we look at what's happening today, we look at the Foxes and the CNNs and we think, oh, these are you know, great institutions and they, they check their data. I used to think that way when I was growing up in this country until I uncovered the onion you know, skins, and I realized, wow, it's satanic filled with blood pretending to have integrity. So how would I process that while I'm acquiring knowledge, how would I know what knowledge is right? This is where that introspective power, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ Allah. See, Allah says, إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتٍ لِأُولِي الْأَلْبَابِ الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا Indeed, Allah says, in the indeed in the creation of the sky and the earth, and in the alternation of night and day, are signs for people who are deeply rooted in knowledge. Who is the one who's deeply rooted in knowledge? One who's cogitative constantly, taking data, processing, and trashing, removing the trash, and processing good information. الذين يذكرون الله they're the ones who think of God قياماً وقعوداً وعلى جنوبهم standing, sitting, and lying on their sides three main positions of the human being وعلى ويتفكرون and they are thinking about this creation what is this world for? yesterday I was young, to them older tomorrow I'll be taken to the grave my father's picture, he was a young man today he's an old man I'm going to be just like that yesterday I was you know, in demand. Today I'm not in demand. Why? Because I have more white hair? Because my hair has fallen off? Because my wrinkles have shown? That's it? You mean all my fantasies when I was 18 has already died? Yeah. Hmm? You love this world? Allah says this is a small moment. It's such a small moment. What have you done with it? So you find these instruments that are here today, you watch television shows, movies, many times you want to watch a movie says, let me learn something, even if it's make-believe, let me come out of it that I learn something morally about it. That I can teach my child to say, watch this, this is a good lesson. Even if it's about a fox and a hen talking, even if it's a cartoon, today cartoons even are loaded 
with so many subliminal messages that my daughter, when she watches it, I'm terrified. She starts, starts, starts making sentences. I say, where'd you, where'd, you, where'd you learn to say this? She says, I watched it in, you know, in, um, for example, Madagascar. I said, really? Oh, yeah. And then I, I move forward. There it is. You know, one of these um, actresses speaking like that. So my daughter is now emulating. I said, wow, even, even what we say, cartoons from Disney are loaded with all kinds of subliminal messages designed to produce what we call this drone society, what we call the matrix society. We're all part of the matrix. Let's not be fooled. That's one movie that I watch. I don't usually watch movies. Somebody directly says, watch the matrix. If you really dig deep, we're living the matrix. We're all coming out of pods. And we're being what we call, what uh, uh, Chomsky says, manufacturing consent. Consent is being manufactured. So what, how do we break out from this? How do we become independent, azadi, as we say? How do we become hurriya, where we have freedom? It's with the aql. This mind, when it starts thinking and proactively moves and holds on to who? Sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim. We say ten times a day, إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صِرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلِيهِ Guide us on the path, the right path. Path of who? Those you have chosen. Who are أَنْعَمْتَ عَلِيهِ You think it's any Joe Schmo? No. Chosen people, specifically that Allah chooses. Allah says, I have chosen them. And they are so strategically chosen that they are in شَجَرَةٍ مُبَارَكَةٍ زَيْتُونَةٍ لَا شَرْقِيَةٍ وَلَا غَرْبِيَةٍ A blessed tree which is neither east nor west. It doesn't belong to any society. Special, chosen. Allah says, فِي بُيُوتٍ أَذِنَ اللَّهِ أَن تُرْفَعَ وَيُذْكَرَ فِي هَسْمُ يُسَبِّهُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِّ وَالْآصَالِ رِجَالٌ لَا تُنْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يوما تتقلب فيها في القلوب والأبصار Look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking He says houses which Allah has exalted that He is remembered through them chosen people Now when I was growing up this was my confusion I need to acquire knowledge I need to sift the trash from the good I am inundated with too much data I'm seeing all kinds of variations. The variables are too many. I cannot process it. I need to stabilize. What's my stability? Even in science, when you do research, you have to have a stabilizing point. Otherwise, you cannot achieve result, results in the research. It's impossible. Because if all the variables are possible, then there is no conclusion. It's impossible. You have to stabilize something. What is my groundwork, my stability? It's Allah and the Prophet, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. The Quran says it strategically, constantly. وَإِن تُطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِتْكُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا If you obey Allah and the Prophet, your deeds are fine. That's the grounding. So acquisition of knowledge is essential. But notice how knowledge is even sifted. When you watch a television show today on, on the news, in other words, you'll see the same event taking place in, in, in Middle East. You watch it from a Middle Eastern news station, you watch it from the Western news station, it's completely filtered and adulterated. Chomsky writes so many ways. He says, take the same, Associated Press will bring one news, all the main conglomerates which are owned by one company, the Murdochs, for example, they will take the same sentence, reshuffle it, same idea, to promote the same political agenda depending on which region of the world you are. But you're not getting the right information. You're fooled. And now you build this... Uh, mental image of what the enemy is like or what the other side is like when it's completely false. And sadly, sadly, it cannot be avoided that even soldiers in the United States, for example, who leave to go and fight, when they come back, they are disconnected from their own families. Because what they saw, they can't tell the society. Because the society doesn't believe them. Because the media conglomerates tell them a whole different story. So they consider this person having post-traumatic stress disorder that he's so out of whack that what he's saying is just a fantasy. What the media is saying is true. Our obligation, brothers and sisters, is to ensure that our children are energized and excited to have this desire to learn. Jahiliya and ignorance is at such levels today that sometimes when you speak to a community, 
not your community, I'm saying in general, the universal community, you find the level of knowledge when it comes even to the basic principles of religion is so shallow that people are just survivors. We're just surviving. Let's feed the refrigerator so that it can feed us. At the end of the day, that's all I want to do. I want to grow old not being hungry. What a foolish state of mind. Whereas Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam, We honored you. We raised you. We gave you this power of intelligence. You can shatter mountains with this mind of yours. This mind is so powerful. It is so capable. Why are we belittling it? So, but when our children, by the way, are engrossed in these games many a times, many times I don't blame them. Look, I'm not here to throw blame on anybody. Often, children indulge in mundane activities because they're not energized. They're not excited by it. They're not given the right stimulus to be attracted towards a direction. We leave them alone. They are basically in autopilot, and in comes MTVs, and in comes all the fad societies, and they have the flashy lights, and the child simply looks, because there's nothing else to look at. We're always waiting for the world to make things available for us. Our sisters have to wear a hijab, so now we have to be second-class citizens waiting for somebody out there to make something better for our sisters so that they can also have a good time. Why can't we take proactive steps? What stopped us? Why can't we build societies that energize and engage our sisters and brothers in proactivity and to keep away from a lot of these technologies that are destructive? Why can't we pr produce more exciting systems? Believe me, when I sit with children many a times, you take this thing away from them and you just give them heart-to-heart -heart talk. Personal touch. You look at them, they look at you, they're alive. They feel alive, they feel important. They're no longer neglected. Many a children I have found are depressed because fathers don't even hug them. Mothers don't even talk to them. When they get home, it's always, don't do this, don't do this, no, no, haram, haram, haram. The child is inundated with negativities. There's no positive. When we say to a child, don't do something, we, should, we better have something that they can do or they should do. Instead of saying, don't do that. How about say, you know, it's better if you don't do that. How about this? Come do this. A child doesn't feel inundated if you've negated with a positive. If you say to the child, don't do this, but how about that? The child says, oh, so the world is filled with alternatives. There are other things I can do in life. That is what children want. And the minute we engage them in a conversation, You'll be surprised what they will say. And they're talking. He says, oh, this is my child. is talking rubbish all the time talking. Never. Every child that talks, it's not rubbish. We said the same things when we were young. Actually, in their world, what they're seeing is what they're telling us. And there's so much purity and honesty in that conversation that you and I can learn a lot from a child's conversation. Sometimes more than when an adult talks. Because when an adult is talking, it's filtered. This one's pure. What better way to learn now imagine if we engage our children at a young age and we engage them in academic discussions where at home when we're sitting around the dining table and eating, which should be a tradition, or sitting on the floor and eating, have conversations, positive conversations. Ask, what happened today? Talk meaningful substance, not what did you buy today? Oh, I saw this product, was good. okay, once in a while you talk about this, but keep the material stuff out, be more engaging spiritually, academically. I've seen people who are very successful in societies who are very intelligent. When I ask them, how did you attain this quality of constant desire to want to learn? He says, my family taught me from a young age. My father would sit and he would talk to us. You know, I had, my life, I say to you, I had a profound impact from my grandfather, my mother's father. He lived to be close to 100 years of age. He had 25 children. Uh, interestingly, I was one of his youngest grandchildren. But whenever I would visit him, he'd just sit down. He's an old man. He was well in his 70s, 80s. He would sit, he'd sit down and he would talk to me. And he would ask me questions. And at that time, I was only eight years of age. But I profoundly remember the conversation, the content. And he would look at me with respect. And he would say, this is what I want you to be like. This is how you will be. And I was like taken aback as, as, as an eight-year-old child. You feel you're insignificant. There's nothing important about me. Why is this 
learned old man who I was so impressed with because every time the missionary would come, the Christian missionary would come, he would invite a whole group of them in the room. Six, seven, eight of them. He'd serve them food. He'd sit with them for hours. And he'd say, okay, open up this chapter. Open up this verse. What does Jesus say here? What and I'm listening to him as a young child. I'm impressed. And then he brings the Quran. He says, look what the Quran says. And these missionaries used to love him as much as they didn't like what he had to say. They used to respect him. And he used to welcome them. And he said, it's okay. This is how it is. As an eight-year-old, I was impacted. That many years later, when I stood in front of my teacher in seventh grade, when I challenged my teacher, who said that Islam is a violent religion, and the prophet of the Muslims was a killer, who used to go door to door killing people and beheading them, I raised my hand, I said, excuse me, I reject this idea, this is false. And that was the first time in my life I actually stood up and I challenged somebody in public. I think about it, where did I get that energy from? To be able to sit in a 35 student class, where I, you know, I'm not that articulate, and I hear I'm challenging my teacher, a, a teacher who's been teaching for 30 years, and I stood my ground and I won the debate and I won the argument. I walked out of that and said, wow, deep down I think, am I gifted? We're all gifted. Who isn't gifted? Show me a human being that's not gifted, please. I'd like to see that. Show me a creature that's not gifted. A dog is gifted. A cat is gifted. An insect is gifted. Who is not gifted? Hmm? أَلَمْ تَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنًا Don't you not see that everything has been made subservient to you? We chose you. So I think about this, you know, the impact of the nurturing. That somebody impacted me. My mother, same thing. As a child, she would constantly recite ayahs of Quran. And I would, I would not understand, but she would repeat it. Don't forget this. Did you hear that? That repetition sank in. That when I went into the university, the first time here, University of Colorado in Boulder, I was bombarded with the Bible Belt evangelical groups coming to my door every single day. I had atheists around me, agnostics all around me. For the first time, I'm exposed to a whole new world that I didn't have in my high school years. And I sustained it. And I was able to maintain my composure and discuss it. And people said, how do you know this? Who taught you this? Where'd you learn this? I said, wow, all it took was all that nurturing. It's just coming out, it's regurgitating. That even now in public life when I speak, sometimes I'll say something and the verse will come up, I didn't even think about it, it's because it's already been planted. So the Quran is basically saying all the time, يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم Who's the beneficiary? Who's the, who's the one who's going to benefit from it? This is what I say to our children, even in Michigan. I said constantly learn one verse, talk it, walk it, say it, live it. You will be surprised how far that verse goes. That sometimes just uttering that one verse, the world around you that sees you will respect you. Even many times people say, by the way, when you talk, sometimes you use these heavy, you know, bombastic English words, you know, I have to look at the dictionary now. I said, good. It's about time you went to dictionary.com <laughs> and look for that word. Yeah, but brother, it's too heavy. I can't process it. I said, it's time you processed it. What do you want? Spoon feeding all the time? No, let's learn a few heavy words. Every once in a while you learn a heavy word, you know what the other side says? Mm, you're a smart guy. Yeah, but I'm the dumbest guy in the world. Yeah, but you know that word, you must be smarter than me. SubhanAllah, it's perceptions, isn't it? Now, of course, we don't want to be dumb, but what I'm trying to say is if you use it contextually properly and you place it in, in position, that individual on the other side sees you with integrity. Now, when it come, what comes out of your mouth thereafter is more what we call acceptable. Because I said, guys, okay, well, this guy's smart. He knows what he's talking about. He's not talking, he's not using four-letter words and you know he's not making you know childish or wild gestures, you know. Right? He's got, he's got a demeanor. Oh, he's got integrity. Let me listen to him. Now I'm not I'm not saying stereotypically the person making gestures is a bad thing. Sometimes the most intelligent people are making those gestures. True. But in the general sense, we're stereotypical. We gauge a person. What are they saying? How are they saying it? I want to believe in this person. Now, if we present ourselves that way, imagine the power. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. In Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Have you not considered how Allah sets forth a parable of a good word? Kalimatin tayyibatin, kashajaratin tayyibatin, asluha thabit. Such a beautiful uh, example. I use this many times in my lectures because I truly believe this sets the metaphor, the, the example of what our obligations should be while we're striving to achieve 
greatness on this earth. He says, the parable of a good word being like a good tree, whose root is firm and whose branches are in the heavens. Meaning it's high. Now when you see a, a grand tree, you're, you're impressed because it does many functional things. And this is a metaphor. Allah says, this tree yields fruit every season by the permission of Allah. And Allah sets forth parables for men that they may be mindful. Now a tree deeply rooted, meaning its access to knowledge is greater. Deeply rooted, for example, is imagine my route goes all the way to China right now. Well, you talk, somebody, a Chinese person talks to me, I have access to the culture of the Chinese. I go to South America, I have access to the culture of the South Americans, their religion, their ideals. See, I, I have a root, for example, if I have a root in Australia, and Australia is talking, I know you, I know where you come from, I know you. This is why Allah says, well, travel. Traveling is very healthy for you. I've seen brothers in my own community, young brothers that I raised practically. You find the intelligence level was a certain level. They were not refined. You can tell. They're still, they need, they need work. And then that same brother gets a job. And his job is to travel the world. A year later, I meet the brother. He's very refined. The way he's talking, the way he's shaking hands. I said, aha, uh -huh. how'd you get so refined so quickly? I'm saying in my head, I said, that travel. He must have traveled the world. He met so many different people. And his vision expanded. And when that vision expands, you become a different person. So notice how Allah has established a very positive thing that we should travel. That when you go to Hajj, for example, where the world travels to a house of Allah, you meet the world. Once again, a social transaction. Meet them. See the various cultures, the various skin colors, the various people. Meet them. They're all submissive to Allah. Isn't that a beautiful world that you live in? Now, look at that white person, that brown person, that yellow person. Look at them there. He says, Allah says, I shaped them. I colored them that way. What do you think? Wow, it's magnificent. Now Allah says, dig deep. There is a reason why I shaped it that way. And why these colors and not that color? Notice there's something in our brains tied in that there are certain colors that fit us. A sky that's totally red is very depressing. A blue sky turns us into active creatures. Why blue versus red? What's the difference? One is low frequency, one is high frequency. So, yeah, but my brain just processes it that Allah says, oh, well, قَدْ زَيَّنَّا السَّمَاءَ الدُّنْيَا بِمَصَابِيحَ وَجَعَلْنَاهَا رُجُومًا لِلشَّعَةِ We created this as a canopy for you and we adorned it. Don't you love to look at the stars? Guess what? When I shaped that star, I also took you into consideration. That that tiny little eye of yours that's taking one photon of light through your brain, and yet allowing you to see, I calibrated it perfectly. Allah says, did you take that into consideration? Now, if a human being takes that consideration, and a child sees that, you realize, you give them these electronic toys, silly toys, they'll say, what is this? Please, I need to do something more important. I need to go deeper into knowledge. I need to understand the dynamics of the world. I said, bravo. So one needs not to be 18, 19, 20 in our modern society to start becoming mature. I believe even a five-year-old can mesmerize us with knowledge. And I'm speaking about knowledge, specifically even this tree. Tree, shajaratin mubarakatin, firmly rooted. You know what a firmly rooted tree does? It brings fruits. It brings shade. It's stable. When there is a storm, the tree doesn't fall because the roots are going to hold it. So when we have a disaster in life, somebody died in my family, or some tragedy took place, or loss of wealth, I'm not going to give up my faith. Because my roots are deep, I'm not shallow. You don't flip-flop from one position to another where you give up belief in Allah, or you give up belief in good and promotions of good, because the roots are deeply uh, entrenched. So why don't we struggle for that, brothers and sisters? We are celebrating the birth of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And his grandson, Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. These role models are what grounds us. I remember in my university when I was having all these evangelical groups coming and talking to me, I said, no problem, I'll join your Bible study, I'm more than happy. Because maybe you're right, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe my religion is wrong. Maybe I've been duped. And I'd like to validate myself with you. 
and I'd like to learn the Bible more, because I think it's my obligation. I live in a Christian world, it's my obligation to know the Judeo-Christian principles. Because how am I going to interact with them with dignity if I don't know what they believe in? I may insult them by saying silly things that may hurt, hurt their feelings. I would go to Bible study, and I would question, and I'd, I'd, I'd place basic questions forward. And what I realized was as we move forward, I realized that most of the quotations that they were quoting come from people God didn't choose. I said, aha, this is a problem even in Islam. We have people who have become muhaddithin, ones who narrate, and they were not chosen by Allah. And we put so much emphasis on them that somehow they become the law. I said, aha, I see how shaitan obfuscates. This message obfuscates, meaning covers. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> how? You get somebody who declares himself a representative. See, in Christianity, with due respect, it's Paul. Paul declares himself a man of God. But he persecuted Christians. He killed Christians. Then he sees Jesus in a dream. I said, how do you follow Paul? He says, Paul, Saint Paul. I said, but Paul was not appointed by God. When, when he, saw God, he saw you know, God in the dream, I said, I can see dreams too. How do I validate this dream? What do you mean by this? I said, and God would give that most powerful message to a man who killed before him? He said, yeah, he's born again. I said, excuse me. I know what born again means, but you are insulting my intelligence. I said, what do you mean? God loves a man, even though he was a killer. Look how merciful God is. I said, really? That how it works? I said, yeah. SubhanAllah. And we have this in Islam too, by the way. <laughs> the shaitan's fingerprints are everywhere. You know that? You study forensic science, <laughs> you see him everywhere. Everywhere he is. I said, okay, so if born again means purity, and therefore there's quality, I said, how about we have a born again child molester, and you need to go on vacation for a weekend, and he's your neighbor. Would you leave your child for one day with him? And the guy looks at me, no. I said, God will leave the whole religion to, to a killer, but you won't leave your child one day with an ex-child molester who's born again? What system is this? <laughs> Can you imagine God forbid tomorrow the devil declares he's a prophet? Well, it's okay, God forgave him. <laughs> and look, he was on the other side of the pendulum swing, so now what's wrong if he's on this side? SubhanAllah. Allah has a principle. Even Iblis himself says, Mukhlasin means who? Mukhlasin means people who are protected, who never make a mistake. They're infallible. They are perfectly chosen by Allah SWT. Allah mentions this for the izzatika law huyanna majma'in illa ibadaka minhumul mukhlasin. Here you find that Quran is establishing a very fundamental principle that yes, you and I can make mistakes. And yes, Allah forgives all. In Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. 100%. Allah says, وَسَارِ عِلَى مَغْفِرَةِ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةِ دَعَرْتُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الذين ينفقون في السراء والضراء والكاظمين الغيظ والعافين عن الناس والله يحب المحسنين الله is talking hasten to forgiveness where a paradise greater than earth and sky put together in quality awaits you who are they they give charity they uphold prayers ينفقون في السراء والضراء good time bad time they give charity والكاظمين الغيظ they hold back their anger والعافين عن الناس they forgive mankind والله يحب المحسنين God loves the good doers Okay, that's a person who's asking for forgiveness, but that does not qualify you to become a divinely appointed leader. Divinely appointed leader has a pathway that must not be manipulated. You manipulate that, you manipulate the religion of God, because the conduit of God is now tainted, which changes the entire dynamics. So when I would ask them these questions, they always try to validate and to uphold the value of this so-called great saint. And I have a problem with that. In Islam, the same situation. When you and I hear, Fulan bin Fulan said, says, hold on, who is this guy? Where did he come from? Who brought him here? What made him so important? Who made him important? Oh, Rasulullah said, I said, I'd like evidence. Because Quran is rejecting that. Quran says, An'amta alayhim, chosen, specially. They say, Man alladhi yashfaw indaw illa bi'ithni. Who can intercede on, the behalf, on behalf of Allah, except by his permission. Who is this person? I said, aha. So as long as I maintain that, 
I will filter my information and I will know who to follow. Because at the end of the day, my knowledge should come from Allah. But the pathway of how knowledge is given to me must be validated. Otherwise, I don't want to hear it. I don't care how great the man is. I, I don't want to belittle a person. Even a born-again person could have done a thousand good things. And I acknowledge them. And I honor them. But I don't listen to them unless there is totality of quality coming from the source of this knowledge, which requires where prophets coming to play. So I noticed in my university years, as long as I maintained my Quranic principles of questioning, Meaning I wasn't biased, I was simply questioning. Allah says, قُلْ هَاتُ بُرْحَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Logical question. I, even my scientific arguments when I was doing my research, I would say, evidence please. We're an evidence-based society. A successful society is evidence-based. This is what atheists argue. We're evidence-based. I said, we are too. We are too, 100%. Believers in God are totally evidence-based. So we're evidence-based. Ha to Burhan, Burhan. Bring your proof if you're truthful. So I would ask them, what's your proof? What's your proof? So Quran is armed means his go. What we reveal in this Quran is a shifa. Go ask them. And I would place it. And they'd be like mesmerized and stumped. I'd ask them again. I says, wow, I see where my roots are. I'm starting to hold it now. I'm feeling the energy. Then great scholars came into my life. Where I started reading books by Mutahari, for example, Shaykh Mutahari. SubhanAllah, what a genius. His ability to dissect knowledge from ground level, zero upward. I said, wow, what a man. This man knows how to bring knowledge forward. Look at him, he's, he's one of those rare personalities in the world who knows how to talk. That in the West, I know how to articulate through such teachers. That's the importance of acquisition of knowledge. So when we are, we are submitting even great personalities like Mutahari, if you read their books, where are they getting the knowledge? From Quran, Rasulullah, and the A'imma. We're celebrating our sixth Imam's birthday. These celebrations are important. Don't be fooled by people saying, you're celebrating birthdays, birthday of the Prophet. It's not a good thing to celebrate. Says who? This is exactly what Shaitan would want us to say. Exactly. Because if you remove this remembrance of a personality, we lose connection with Allah. Because there's no way to say la ilaha illallah without a role model. Impossible. That even when you love someone and they're not close to you, you can just not say I love you without going towards them and hugging them. That physical touch and expression completes the objective. That even when you go to the grave of the Prophet, you find Muslims, not only Shia, but Sunni, all Muslims, are dying to touch the grave of the Prophet. Why? Because there's a love relationship. You go to the Kaaba, you want to touch Hajj al Aswad. Why? It's only a stone that's from a meteor. Yeah, but I love it. Why do you love it? It's a stone. Because it represents God. It's a center of the earth. It's spiritual. It's symbolic. It's sublime. There are so many things. The Prophet touched that stone. I want to touch it. See? What's wrong with that? That connection is beautiful. So when we mem remember our imma, it's exactly that level. And the Quran proves it. You find in Ashab al Kaf, I don't have time to discuss it, but in Surat al Kaf, you find when those youth who slept for 300 solar years, 309 lunar years, when they rose, they were miracles. People built a masjid above them. Quran mentions that. After the death, People built a masjid over them. Allah upholds it and said, look how much they honored them. They even built a masjid over there. Today, we've got ignorant people who want to take the grave of the messenger and the green dome and they want to demolish it and take his body, exhume it, and take it to Jannah al -Bakhi. This is how jahil our Muslim ummah is. How stupid they are. That the messenger's wisdom is of the highest quality. He decreed that he should be buried there. By whose authority do you and I have to change the decree of Allah and the messenger? and dare to call ourselves Muslims. But that is the jahiliyyah that the Prophet was saying, that ignorance is so destructive that it will even cancel out all these important facts. So when we celebrate, it's because we want to constantly remind ourselves. Look, when a child has a big poster of a basketball player, why does a child, it cannot be a small picture, it's gotta be a grand one that covers half the wall, right? Why? He has to be overbearing in your, because this is my idol, okay? But what does this idol represent to you? Morals? Is he going to teach you anything? Besides being a great sportsman, these are the ones who hop beds, who do all kinds of bad things, who have a foul tongue. Can we follow them morally? 
Our children should have a poster in their head of Allah's representatives. Now you might say, how practical is that? It's very practical. Look around you in society, there are people who are working to emulate those prophets, who are working to emulate the a'imma. Look at them and get near them, associate with them. Birds with the same feathers will flock together. So if we do that, now what happens is we protect our imam. So when we're celebrating the birth of our blessed imam, we should remember these personalities are the ultimate. When it comes to teaching, when it comes to wisdom, when it comes to every positive quality a human being can possess, these representatives have it. So let's talk about Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wa sallam. Salatu Allah Muhammad Allah. Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam was born 83 years after Hijrah. It's a very interesting history. As you know, the Imams that came, A'imma, from Imam Ali alayhi salam forward, you find that many interesting things happened. And people took positions and powers where the dynasty started, especially the Umayyad dynasty got its deep roots through Muawiyah having been the governor of Damascus. And as you know, Damascus was, a, was Syria. Syria was Christian, okay, the Byzantine Empire. And it was defeated under the second caliph. It basically, they surrendered. They weren't really defeated, they surrendered. And the first governor of Damascus was Muawiyah's elder brother who died Shortly thereafter, Muawiyah takes position and he trenches himself deep and extracts the wealth of the Muslims and ultimately uses it to position himself to become the Khalif. And he declares himself as the fifth Khalifa. Now, if you look at how he became a Khalif and what he did today, the echoes of the Muslim world suffering and the killing, the machinery that's taking place right now, the billions of dollars being used right now, as Muslims are shooting Muslims with Allahu Akbar, this gun, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, this jahiliya, this, these are the echoes of the Umayyads. The Umayyads did this. They were the, what we call the fathers of the modern sickness that we have. So Muawiyah orchestrated, his father failed, remember, Abu Sufyan failed. He couldn't. He joined Islam. And then he kicked the grave of Hamza when he was blind. And he said, your fathers that fought my fathers in Badr, today that religion of your fathers is in my hand. This is what Abu Sufyan said to Hamza, Sayyid al-Shuhada's grave. And Muawiyah took power. And Muawiyah created the most tragic machine that its echoes continue until today. And our Muslim world today is a servant. Of, of lords out there that want nothing but our destruction. Exactly what Muawiyah wanted. He tried even to take the pulpit of the Prophet to move it from Medina to, the, to Syria. Why? So the, the Medina people should not remember the Prophet. He used to always say, that brother of Hashim has even put his name in the Adhan. That's how he was so annoyed by the Messenger of Allah. This is Muawiyah. So the dynasty starts and our Imams are prevented from expressing knowledge. Exactly what Iblis said. فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ By your authority, I am going to beguile them. One method of beguiling is to prevent us from learning. Sadly, we live in a society where knowledge is accessible at our fingertips, but we're not interested. I remember history where Imam Ali Islam says, سَلُونِي سَلُونِي قَبْلَ أَن تَفْقِدُونِي Ask me, ask me before I'm buried. But people would ask dumb questions, like how much hair do I have on my head? Hmm? How stupid. Now imagine if people asked valid questions. Where would you and I be today in the scope of knowledge of understanding things? But Allah has a plan for what the Imams did were twofold. One, they were the Bab of Medina, meaning they are the door that protects the knowledge. You cannot adulterate the Prophet if you have the Imam present. I believe the intactness of Islam growing even today is because of the hard work of Ahlul Bayt. Hands down. Even if we don't believe they even exist, the effect is because of them. 100%. Otherwise, we would have a carcass of a religion that is so infiltrated that you and I would have no idea what's going on. The Quran's intactness, the deen's intactness in its holistic form, meaning the Kaaba, the Salah, the Saum, 
the Prophet, Allah, if you take all these and place them, the protection is because of Ahlul Bayt that came after the Holy Prophet. If not for them, Muawiyahs and the Banu Umayyahs and the Banu Abbasids would have had a field day. They would have dismantled every aspect of deen and left us just a shell, and you and I would have been so confused, we wouldn't know up from down. But Allah has promised us that never, this shall never happen. As long as mankind has been created, in fact, the world was created because of the guidance of the pure representatives of Allah. Otherwise, it would not have been created. There would be no purpose in life. So, Imam Jafar Sadiq was born in a period which was very, very interesting. Because historically, the Umayyads had gone to their maximum decadence. They say Yazid was so decadent. Muawiyah was so decadent, Muawiyah used to have an animal stuffed inside an animal, stuffed inside an animal, stuffed inside an animal, and in each layer he'd have a coating of chocolate and something. The most gluttonous individual you would ever imagine in history, one of them was Muawiyah. Quran says, إِنَّ الْمُبَذِّرِينَ كَانُوا إِخْوَانَ الشَّيَاطِينَ وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِرَبِّهِ كَفُورًا مُبَذِّرٌ Extravagant extremely ostentatious, one who tries to show off too much. This is exactly, Muawiyah well, created a kingship dynasty that today you look at the Sauds who have stolen the land. This is a family that put their name on that land. One of the few besides King Philip of Spain who took the Isles of, uh, today called Philippines, took those islands and called it his own name, Philippines. In history, very few people have managed to put their own name their own family name or a country. You find, I call it the kingdom of Saudi occupied Arabia. And you find this same people, the way they live, you walk, you, you, you travel in those places and see the palaces of these kings, you can't even get near them. This is not the Sunnah of Rasulullah. This is not how Islam projects it. Islam forbids such ideas. But look, they're called ha Khadimul Haramain. How can you be a Khadim? You are the antithesis of Khaddam. Huh? Believe me, how can you call yourself Khadim al Haramain? But look, it's accepted. People throw their hands in the air and say, it's okay, because God decreed it. And Quran says, you know, only Amri Minkum, obey them. Rubbish. Obey them what? If I have to obey them, then I have to obey Pharaoh in the time of Pharaoh. Then when the Pharaoh was ruling, then the Bani Israel should have obeyed Pharaoh, because he was only Amri Minkum. What silly thing is this? Imam Jafar Sadiq comes in a critic. Every Imam history, you show how they played the role of ensuring Islam remains intact. The Umayyad Empire ruled for 89 years. 1,000 months they ruled. From the time of Muawiyah forward. The collapse came under the grandson of Hisham bin Abdul Malik. And you find at that time our fifth Imam and the sixth Imam were within that stage. As you know, Imam Jafar Sadiq was an Imam for over 30 years. He died at the age of 65. And for a good 12 years, he was under the tutelage of Imam Zainul Habirin So our fourth Imam basically raised our sixth Imam. And as you know, our fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Bakr was in Karbala at the age of three. At the age of three, he was a witness in Karbala. He witnessed his grandfather's slaughter. He witnessed his uncles getting beheaded. Imam Muhammad Bakr Now Imam Muhammad, Muhammad Bakr used to hold classes, Imam Jafar Sadiq was quite young, that students who were the top students of Imam Muhammad Bakr used to come and confer with Imam Jafar Sadiq and they would have discussions with the sixth Imam. That even in knowledge of astronomy, there's a time when the students were debating and discussing astronomy in the class of Imam Muhammad Bakr class. And Imam Jafar Sadiq walks in, sits, and he stipulates to them that please understand that the earth is not flat, it's a sphere. This spherical perspective, Imam describes it, why the crescent of the moon forms the way it does. And the students were stunned by our Imam's knowledge of simply the fact that the earth is not flat, which is common knowledge at that time. And this is how our blessed Imams were known. They were known to be the scions of knowledge. And interestingly, we study Islam today, that you find, during the time of Imam Jafar Sadiq you find that the Umayyad Empire collapsed and the Abbasid Empire started within that span of time. And you find that during that period of time, there was a very interesting history. See, the caliphs that came in power were focused on the Imams. Why? Because they knew what the Prophet said. These are my gates, and they are the means to me. 
awwalun wa awsatun wa akhirun wa kullun muhammad whoever so when you look at the imams and imam jafar sadiq himself says he says my quotation is my father's quotation which is my grandfather's quotation which is my great grandfather's quotation which goes back to the prophet he says i say nothing of myself i only say what the prophet said i do not bring new religion i do not innovate anything i am simply a reflector of the light of the prophet period it's elegant i tell you it's sublime the system of allah in this is second to none on earth in any religion you study there's nothing like this nothing believe me and i don't claim to be a great scholar in this matter but i have delved deep into these areas only to find is there something out there that's missing that i have not seen you find that our imam at that time was able to teach why because the caliphs were busy killing each other the caliphate had reached a level of decadence and weakness that the Abbasid started to rise. Now remember, Abbas was the uncle of the Prophet. And Abbas wasn't such a good person, historically. Okay. Uh, his son, Abdullah ibn Abbas, was a very close companion of the Prophet. He's a muhaddith, well recognized by all schools of thought. Abdullah ibn Abbas. And he was very close to Imam Ali alayhi salam also. Now the Banu Abbasid were also known as Banu Hashim. And remember, the rule of thumb is, in the appointment, only the Banu Hashim were brought in. One dhur ashir takel aqrabin. Warn your near ones. And the Prophet asked that monumental question, who will be my uh, successor brother protector? And only the Banu Hashim would ask this question. So when the Umayyads had reached this level of decadence, and Imam Hussein's shahada had already taken place, and the cracks had already shown up in the foundation of the Umayyad Empire after Karbala, the Abbasids decided to capitalize on that. And they said, look, no one can be a Khalifa except from the family of the Prophet. So they took half the story and they marginalized it, capitalized it in other words, and they put it on a, with black flags, started running around and saying that we are the rightful successors to the Prophet. So the Caliphate of the Umayyads is illegitimate and it must be replaced by us. And how did they do that? They used the popularity of Ahlul Bayt to promote themselves. This is exactly what Mahmoud did, son of Harun al-Rashid. He used Imam Rida salam precisely to promote his own agenda. Imam Jafar Sadiq salam was under the same problem with Mansur Dawaniki. And you find Imam Muhammad Baqir was under the same problem. Every Imam, even Imam Zayn al was used by the empires to promote their own agenda because they all knew the source of religion and the power of religion comes from Ahlul Bayt. This is not secret. Every Muslim knew that. Even when Imam Ali al-Islam's Khilafah was taken, the first person to go to his house was the same enemy who was... Help me. No, no. Who was Sufyan? Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was the first person to go in. He said, I have my hand on the sword. They have taken your right away. I am ready to fight. Imam says, get out of my face, you troublemaker. You want to divide the Muslims. Leave me alone, because he wanted to destroy Islam. This is a great opportunity, but look at the wisdom, the hikmah of our imams, that they did not allow these, these nascent situations to be taken advantage of by enemies. And the imam says, get out of my face. So if Abu Sufyan himself recognized who the successor should be, what else is left? So the Banu Abbasid, they move the Umayyads out of place, and they take power. During this time, Imam Jafar Sadiq was busy teaching. And his school was grand. If you go to Medina, his, they say that at least 4,000 students, if not thousands of students, but they say four, 5,000 writings in terms of hadith had been quoted from Imam Jafar Sadiq And who were his students? It's profound. You find Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa was a student of Imam Jafar Sadiq. He is one of the founders of the schools of Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah. As you know, Ahl Sunnah al Jama'ah have four schools. Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi'i, and Hanbali. The two, teacher, the two students who are the teachers of the two schools, Imam Malik and Imam Abu Hanifa, were both students of Imam Jafar Sadiq directly. In fact, historians say that Abu Hanifa was a supporter of Imam Jafar Sadiq in many ways. In fact, he was against Mansur Dawaniqi. And he used to call them illegitimate. He said, you are an illegitimate Khalifa. You do not deserve this position. And as you know, Abu Hanifa was imprisoned by Mansur Dawaniki, and he dies in prison. 
Okay? But Abu Hanifa also came up with ideas with Imam Jafar Sadiq rejected. For example, Qiyas, using analogy to derive law. Imam Jafar Sadiq said, this is not within the prescription of Allah. You have no authority to use analogy to derive law. So Abu Hanifa had differences with Imam Jafar Sadiq, but he respected him as his teacher. And Imam Jafar Sadiq used to have all his students under his tutelage. So interestingly, when you study history and you find that all the great schools of Islam today were all, they are all subjected, they're indebted to the teacher of Imam Muhammad, Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi It's obvious that we have to understand where did this knowledge, the stream of knowledge come from? Where was this wisdom from? It came from Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi through the Prophet. So notice the power of Imam, the power of Wilaya, the power of Ahlul Bayt is so profound that even the other schools of thought are benefiting from these great teachers. Who can deny that? It's common history. SubhanAllah. Imam Malik bin Anas himself was a student of Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi He's one of the teachers. And the other two students, Imam, Imam Shafi and Imam Ham, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, they learned from these first two teachers. So in principle, all four teachers were taught actually by Imam Jafar Sadiq. So if you think about this quality that we take, that the profound nature of our blessed Imam was knowledge. And one thing Imam Jafar Sadiq used to stress on his students, he said, all of you when you sit, take a pen, I mean take a writing material and write what I say. Don't just sit and listen to me, write what I say. Why did the Imam do that? When they would come and ask him questions, he says, sit down, write what I say. Because Imam is now establishing the foundation of knowledge and hence we today are known as, among the Madahib, we are known as the Ja'afari school of thought because of this great fountain of knowledge given to mankind. Salawat ala Muhammad. Allah. 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 I'm going to conclude. I apologize if I'm taking a little extra time. But Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salam, quality was so sublime. Once he was in a masjid, all Imams are like that. SubhanAllah, when I re re read stories of Imam Hussain alayhi salam, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, Imam Ali alayhi salam, boy, they're all just the same person, different times. Imam Jafar Sadiq was praying, and there was a man who had a thousand dinars, and he was a stranger who came in, and in his bag, he had a thousand dinars, in his salah, where to the wudu, comes back, he finds his money is missing. So the only person praying in the masjid was Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi so he goes to the Imam and says, I think you stole my thousand dinars. Look, you and I would get angry. Excuse me, what's wrong with you? You know, let's go outside, step outside, right? No. The Imam says, come with me. He takes him to his house, and the Imam gives him a thousand dinars. The man takes the bag, he's happy, satisfied, goes back. And as he's looking through his bag, he notices that actually he put his money in another bag. So he realizes, I falsely accused the Imam. So quickly, he goes back to the Imam. I imagine somebody's just giving you a thousand dinars. That's a lot of money. <clears throat> he apologizes to the Imam. And the Imam, he gives him a thousand back. Imam says, no. We Ahlul Bayt, when we give something, we never take it back. SubhanAllah. See? وَيُتَعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّي مِسْكِينَ وَيَتِيمَ وَأَصِيرَ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا how many people do you know in the world today, 7 billion, that have this capacity? Tell me. There was a man who was cursing Imam Jafar Sadiq. Every time Imam would pass, he would curse him. So Imam wouldn't say anything. The companion says, you know, Yabna Rasulullah, this man is very angry with you. Imam said, it's okay. It's okay. How many of us have Qadimin al ghayth the power to swallow our anger? Somebody's cursing you. And you're not talking about an ordinary man here. This is a, a representative of God who's being cursed. You want to say, it's okay. So one day he says to the companions, come with me. He goes to the man's house. It was a farm. As he's entering the farm, the man is standing at the door, thinking that this man, the imam, is coming now to settle a score, you know, with all this cursing. The imam looks at him and says, I've come to inquire the value of your land. And the man gives him a value. Imam doubles it, gives him a bag and says, I want to buy it from you. Doubles the money and gives it to him. The man looks up in the sky and says, Allah knows where to put his imams. Now what did it mean? Imam looked at the companion and says, his land was barren. He was angry with Allah. And who better to be angry than with me? So I fixed it and I took care of it. How many of us have that capacity? When it comes to wisdom, 
in the ability to express, even when we talk about limited free will. A man comes and says, Yabna Rasulillah, what do you mean by destiny? Because by the way, in the time of our sixth Imam, atheism became prevalent, agnosticism was prevalent, all kinds of sophistic, sophistry was prevalent. Various brands of Islam were forming, hundreds of them. And Imam quickly brought things together, very articulately brought it together. When we see the Usulis of today, for example, they, their foundation is Imam Jafar Sadiq, very powerful. The power of logic, second to none. Even Mansur Dawani used to bring Imam Jafar Sadiq in, in public. And he would bring Christians, Jews, atheists, and Imam would debate them in public. And some of them publicly would, be, would declare Islam in public. That's how great our blessed Imam was in terms of his wisdom, in terms of his knowledge. And he would sit with atheists. Ibn Abi Awja was a famous atheist. Imam would never harm him, would always gentle with him. All the time he would talk to him. And, and one time, in fact, one of the companions of Imam Jafar Sadiq debated with Ibn Abi Awja. And he raised his voice a little bit. And Ibn Abi Awja looked at him and says, your teacher is better than you. He said, why? He says, all my life I've been debating this man. He never raised his voice in front of me. That's, Udu'ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal mawidatil hasana. So a man comes and says, is there totality of destiny? Imam says, no, it's limited free will. He said, explain. He says, raise one leg. The man raises one leg. He says, keep it up. He said, did you do it willfully? He said, yes. He said, while you keep the first leg up, the first foot up, raise the other. And the man says, I cannot. He says, that's the limited free will. You have limited, the other is decreed. You can't do it. He says, there's a mixture. Understand that? Wow. SubhanAllah, the profound quality of a teacher of that nature, SubhanAllah, 14 centuries later, we are, we are cutting through knowledge because of these great Imams that came to teach us. You find, same, Abu Hanifa once challenges Imam Jafar Sadiq. I'll make this as a final point, inshallah, I'll end. Where Imam Jafar Sadiq says there are three things that Allah has decreed. One, Allah is, vis is, is present, but not visible. He cannot be touched, nor seen, nor will he ever be seen. Though Allah is ubiquitous, he's present. Ubiquitous means he's everywhere. Uh, second, uh, shaitan is created from fire, Iblis, and he'll be punished by fire. Third, he said, Allah created us, but we are liable for our own deeds. Out of his mercy he created us, we're liable for our own deeds. So on Judgment Day, the good we do, we benefit, the bad we do, we benefit, uh, we will suffer. In ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. When you do good, it's good for yourself. So Hanifa stands up and says, how can it be? God being there not be seen. I cannot understand that. Second, he said, how can something, the same material, make it and punish it? Doesn't make sense. And the third, he said, it was God's decision to create us. He didn't ask us. He never took our permission. So why should we be liable? He should be liable. It was his decision to start this whole thing. Now, Imam Jafar Sadiq's quality of teaching was so supreme that he had students in his crowd that were second to none. One of them was named Bahlul. Bahlul, as you know, was a brilliant scholar, but he acted dumb in front of Harun al-Rashid. You see, in the time of Harun, for example. Bahlul, by the way, lived with across three imams. So Bahlul stands up and takes a piece of clay and throws it on this man. So Bahlul is arrested. The judge says, hey, you just hit the man. What's the problem? He says on the basis of his argument. Now look at the wisdom of our blessed imam. He throws the rock on him. Not rock, it was a piece of clay. He says, prove your point. He said, he says, God, if he's present, must be seen. He says, that's right. He says, well, he's complaining of pain by this thing I hit him. Can you please show it to us? We'd like to see it. <laughs> of course, you can't do that. <laughs> but he, he is suffering from pain. Imam says, fire can punish fire because you and I are made of clay. How did this clay punish you? I hit you, you got hurt. So how did it hurt you? So can fire punish fire. He says, the third thing you claim Allah created us, and he should be liable. Well, I just did something supposedly wrong. Why are you arresting me? You should arrest Allah. <laughs> <laughs> and they were stumped by those three arguments. Now, this is a student. Imagine the imam. Right? So I conclude on this, that he had students, Jabir ibn Hayyan, a great chemist. He's known as the father of chemistry, al-Jabr. 
Okay, father of chemistry, Jabir bin Hayyan. Imam used to have classes just teaching them chemistry, teaching them astronomy, teaching them astrology, how to look at stars and what happens and what, all these things that blessed Imam was a genius, but he only gave what was needed for the time. Because there's one rule of thumb, prophets and imams do not come as scientific, uh, what we call prodigies, that are gonna come and discover all the secrets of science. No, they don't do that, though they know it. You ask, why not? They said, because God says, you as a human race already have that ability, you go get it yourself. But morals, system of morals, you don't have it. Who's gonna teach you? This is why prophets and imams showed us that. But they did the science just to prove to us they were just not philosophers. They were touched, they were, their hands were with the reality. And this is how our blessed Imam, and at that time, you find the dynasty was changing and the Abbasid Empire came in. And during that time, they left the Imam alone, which was the time when knowledge sprouted. Now imagine if these horrible caliphs were not there for all the period of time. I think you and I would be traveling with the flash of an eye, just like the throne of Bilqis. Because when Suleiman is asking, how did you bring this? Hmm? How did you bring this throne? He's asking, as you know, uh, Asif ibn Barhiya was the successor of Suleiman. He asks him, how did you bring this throne to such a distant land? You defied physics. He says, I know a few of Allah's names. Imagine if you know a lot of them, and we could have had it. But Shaitan says, for the So what is your and I do, our duty today, here in Denver, anywhere on earth? Promote knowledge, excellence. Our children going to school, we don't want them to go to second class school, top schools. They have to go to Ivy's if they can get in. It's not about money. Get into the top schools, get the best degrees. I'm telling you, get into the best positions. If we don't, we will always be second class citizens. Our Imams have left us with a legacy that no one on earth deserves to be holding that mantle of knowledge and wisdom like the followers of Ahmed Bayt. And shame on us if we are second-class citizens and we don't strive to reach. I may not reach the top, but if I can become one stool, one footstool for somebody to step on me to get higher, then let it be. This is how our next generation is going to reach the level of leadership which is going to bring wisdom and equity on earth. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma inna nargabu ilayka fi dawlatin kareema تعزوا بها الإسلام وأهله وتذلوا منها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة إلى تعتك والقادة إلى سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة My brothers and sisters, I don't know if we have enough time, five minutes, maybe. If anybody has any questions or comment to make, please. Uh, some brothers have recommended that some of you may have something to ask or something that I say that needs correction or you want to add something more, please. I, I think it would be an honor this is my last night tonight, and I'm honored to be here. Really, Allah bless you. Allah bless the organizers. I also want to acknowledge, by the way, before the questions, the sisters who did a fantastic, and the brothers, uh, brothers and sisters who did a fantastic job yesterday at the university. Fantastic in the sense of arranging the program. And today, thousand roses, you know, in the streets. This is the message of Islam. Every time they vilify the Prophet, we're going to add more flowers on the street. Every time they vilify, we're going to show them with greater uh, gratitude through kindness, because that's the way we're going to defeat the system. We will not fight them back with anything else but with a smile and a kind gesture. I tell you, you say courtesy costs nothing, it buys everything. So I want to thank you all for the fantastic work that you're doing. You're a small community, but it's vibrant, and I can see you reaching out. You know, it's interesting, I see some brothers and sisters who become Muslims here. I see some communities 30 years, I haven't seen a single Muslim. Become a Muslim, in other words, you know, from outside. It's like a cocoon. In your community, you're a mixture of people coming. That, to me, is more dynamic and more vibrant than a grand community of 10,000 people where you don't really see much results. So it's qualitative, not quantitative. Anybody have a question or comment to make? Yes, Brother Masa. I know everybody's probably tired, but this stuck in my mind. You were talking about St. Paul and how he came in uh, to his nifaq, his hypocrisy, changed the message and you were starting to touch up on how it was done in Islam and you kind of went uh, to a different subject. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure, take an example like Muawiyah. 
Muawiyah was known to be a man, the question a brother is asking is with regards to Paul, as you know, he was a Roman Jew. His original name was uh, Saul of Tarsus. Uh, and he becomes a Christian, as you know, later on in time. And now he's considered a saint, a saintly figure. In the same analogy, you'll see that in Islamic history, you have people who took the reins of power and they became uh, the conduit for religion. And what Muawiyah did was he had a Zuhri, for example. He's a, he's a famous Muhammad. If you ever study the Sahih Sitta, study major Sihas, you'll find if you break it down, you'll see most of this knowledge comes from one man, a Zuhri. This has been done scientifically. One of the experts who did this was Sayyid Murtada Askari, who recently died in, in Iran. He was a brilliant scholar who was, who was a well-known historian. Now, what did Muawiyah do? He created a machine of hadith. He used to take every praise of Ahlul Bayt and he would switch it for those he liked. And so today we have thousands of collections of hadith that are fabricated and false. So it's, it's just, it's completely, we're inundated by it. And that is why, Imam, by the way, one of the things Imam Jafar Sadiq said, which he taught his students, he says, any hadith you hear, any, even mine, take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah. And remember, the Qur'an is the Furqan. It is the ultimate judge. If the Qur'an accepts it, accept it. If Qur'an rejects it, I don't care who says it, reject it, categorically. That's the science we must follow. Qur'an is the Furqan. Even the Prophet said, anything that's ascribed to me, take it back to the Qur'an. If it rejects it, and the people insist on it, take that hadith and throw it on the wall in front of them, and tell them we reject it. So this fabrication is a good example. This infiltration. What happened even after, the, after the, the demise of the messenger, as we know historically. So even when you look at the Abbasid and the, the Caliph, the Imam Ali al mentions, he says they've taken it and they throw it on each other's lap like it's a game. Exactly, when Mamun became Khalifa, he killed his brother Salim. Salim wanted the Caliphate on one side, Mamun wanted it, and they kill each other. And then Harun al-Rashid was asked, your two sons, Mamun and Salim, if they covet this throne, would you let them? He said, I will kill both of them. Imam says, look, it wasn't even given to them, but look how they kill with it. So they pretend to be representatives, they are known as khulafa, and yet you find they're totally bankrupt. Today you find the Khadim al Haramain, the same thing. What do they do? They prevent Islam. They marginalize Islam. They use extremist forms in order to present a brand of Islam that is not in Islam. And then today an average Westerner sees that. I remember I was talking in the University of uh, Maryland, and a, and a couple, old couple came, and they said, everything you've said makes a lot of sense, but I have a problem with your religion. I said, what do you mean? He says, look, in Saudi Arabia, a woman cannot drive. What Islam, what religion of God is this? I said, but that's not religion. He says, no, well, do you blame me? That is the heart of your religion. The leaders are what they, they say that their constitution is the Quran. So I'm assuming there's a law in your book that forbids a woman from driving. See? I said, subhanAllah, look how the enemy has thought. I said, if I ever wanted to marginalize Christianity, I should take over the Vatican. Place my own puppet there. I got hands. Now I'm controlling Christianity. Exactly what they're doing for Islam. That you find Lawrence of Arabia with the British Empire goes in and places these nomads who become Khadim al Haramain and they place Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab as the, the religious branch. Both two are illegitimate. That today pretend to represent Islam, that have taken our communities out of whack even in focusing on the basic issue of Islam. Yeah, it's designed that way. How do you stop the growth of this great religion? Allah says, وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرُوا اللَّهُ اللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plan, Allah plans too. Just like Mamun. When Mamun planned to bring Imam Radha to Iran, uh, to Persia, that was the biggest mistake he made in his life, but it was the best thing he ever did. Because when Imam Radha went to Iran, it became so powerful as a movement that 95% of Iran today is Ahl Bayt followers. It has become such an indomitable force when it comes to Ahlul Bayt that even Mahmoud is kicking himself in the grave. <laughs> you ask an average person from that part of the world, he says, that's my Imam. SubhanAllah, good, you can have him. Just like he's ours, isn't it? Have him, live by his standards. He's for all of us, Rahmatul Alameen. Isn't that great? Allah is the best of planners, isn't he? Okay, watch what's coming around tomorrow. You will see what the plan is. Allah is the best of planners. What we should do is align ourselves with the truth and see where it takes us.
Any final questions before I leave? I read somewhere, and I don't know if it's authentic or not, but uh, I read somewhere, and who has some these souls, but I am not confirmed about this, and I want to find out if you can authenticate that. That Umar, when he was uh, before Islam, buried his daughter when he was when she was born. Is it uh, something that authenticated in the Sunni books, or it is just a rumor? No, there are, I have read, I have read writings on that too, yes. Because remember, they came in the period of Jahiliya, they were idol worshippers, yes. And they did practice those. The burying of uh, their daughters was was practiced by them, yes. And how did it? From what I have read, uh, I mean, I look, I, I'm, I'm not going to claim to be an expert on what I have read. I have not validated it. I have read it. I have read it from their sources. How true that source is, you'd really have to melt it down and break it down. Yes. Can we continue the Q&A after dinner? Yeah, so we're out of time, but inshallah. But like I said, I, I, I've read it, but I have not um, validated how true. Because, you know, one can quote Shia sources, Sunni sources about anything and everything. To me, I think the relevance is uh, uh, following this clear prescription of Allah and Amta Ali. And may Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.